Hello, hello everybody. You are so, so welcome. I was going to say good morning there, but we're at 12, so I'll say good afternoon. Um, but you're all very welcome to the Conquering Our Imposter Syndrome Link and Learn. Um, so for any of you that don't know me, my name is Shannon McGowan and I'm the Rethink Resilience Worker here at Business in the Community. Um, so you may have sat in on some of our workshops before and you may actually know Edward Hanna here with us today. Um, Edward is from Utopian Learning. Um, he's a CEO and he has many different accredited trainings um, within that Utopian Learning um, with a, in a range of different areas. Edward, I don't know how you do it all. But Edward was here um, previously, probably in March time, doing um, confidence workshops. And this imposter syndrome uh, series actually came off the back of that. There was a lot of feedback, just um, people asking could we specifically cover imposter syndrome. So that was really, really nice to see. Um, so we're very excited for it. Um, it's going to be a lovely, lovely four weeks, I think. Now, for any of you that can't join us for the four sessions, don't worry. They, they all will be recorded and all the resources will be sent out by email. Um, so that, that's good. Um, so we're just going to start today. I suppose if you have any questions or any concerns, just pop them into the chat box. I'll actually give my email address as well. So if you, if you have any anonymous questions or anything like that, you can send them across. But I suppose the main focus today is... Um, just, I suppose, building our core confidence and focusing on our under, understanding our values, our purpose and our worth, which Edward will definitely help us do. So we only have the hour, so I'm going to pass you straight over to Edward. Um, Edward, are you ready for today's session? Because I know I am. I'm so excited for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am Shannon. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for business and the community for uh, having us back. Um, I really do enjoy these uh, short, snappy workshops um, with a, I suppose an opportunity to engage you in, in something a little bit different or indeed something that you maybe have heard about. Um, and I like this old uh, connotation of being able to take you down the rabbit hole um, to be your journey. Um, to, to work with you on your journey of learning, um, to be a guide. Um, for those who have worked with me before and those who haven't, um, I am a very ordinary person, just like everybody else. Um, I have my own journey with uh, mental health, mental well-being, and indeed this thing we're going to talk about, imposter syndrome. Um, so I come at this as, a, as an ordinary person, uh, not a counsellor, not a psychologist, not somebody who has studied this all of their lives to work in it professionally. I am somebody like yourselves. I own, I own businesses. I have run organizations. And data see some names coming up and down here. And I, I think I might know some people um, uh, as well. So, um, you know, being, being around the, the, the world, um, enjoyed life, but importantly had this um, little self-doubt, this little uh, worry about that I was in some way not able or not capable um, or I was in the wrong place um, to do what I needed to do. Indeed, I always start this conversation by saying to you all today, um, there's a 416 billion to one chance that Shannon or Sandra or Patricia is here today. And I think we've nearly 70 people on. So if you do the homework yourself, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not good at maths, um, but that's quite a big uh, number when you times 416 billion to one by the number of people on here today. And what that says is you were designed to be here today. You have all the gifts, you have all the qualities, you have all the skills to do what you need to do. And imposter syndrome is that Simply that experience or feeling like you're a phony. Like you feel as though uh, any moment you're going to be found out that you're a fraud, uh, like you don't belong where you are, or you only got there maybe through dumb luck. And it can affect anyone, folks. It can affect anyone, no matter their social status, their work, their background, how much money they have in the bank, how successful they are, their skill level, or even their degree. Or, or degree of expertise um, like they have. And I believe many, many, many of us suffer from this, both as parents, and I know some of you out there today, like, like myself, have family, and we suffer through imposter syndrome as parents, um, as employees, as business owners, as CEOs. Um, 
And importantly, what I want to start with by saying this concept of imposter syndrome, this idea, it's still quite young. It's still quite, um, let's say, uh, under-researched. Um, so again, um, nobody has a, a very strong monopoly over exactly what it is. Um, but what I want to say to you before we start looking just a little bit at what we're going to do, I want to acknowledge the fact that imposter syndrome is heavily linked to confidence, our more apt self-confidence, okay? Self-confidence. So I want you to hold on to that um, uh, little word of self-confidence. Um, hopefully you'll have maybe got this um, uh, little uh, program out from business in the community. I know Shannon had, had sent that around people. I just want to just briefly, um, if I may, take a little moment with you to look at what we're what, what we're going to look at, what I'm going to guide you on. And importantly, at the end of this, what I hope you will then take on yourself and say, do you know what? I want to learn a little bit more about this. I want to apply some of the things that, that Ed has guided me into. I, I like to theme, see, think of them as little golden nuggets. Um, my job isn't to say, here's everything that you need to do. My job, hopefully, as part of this four-week program, is to inspire you to inspire you in such a way that you feel confident about going into the world and, and thinking about imposter syndrome in a different way and to then start to do something for yourself. Um, and that's a big part of how we essentially uh, get over or conquer imposter syndrome is this degree of self. So we're going to look um, at sort of five, uh, four, four key areas here over the next number of weeks. We're going to start today by Looking at this concept of what is imposter syndrome, um, I call it uh, introduction to imposter syndrome or imposter syndrome and me. So what I really want you to do today as I talk and we look at some slides and uh, and I, indeed, please feel free to jump in at any stage. And, and if you want to talk or, or say something, um, please, please feel free to do that. Um, but today is about imposter syndrome and me. OK, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, my understanding of it, hopefully guide you on that. Um, and I want you to reflect just on some of those things that we talk about. We might also get a little chance today to just briefly look at the five types of imposter syndrome. And that's really important. Um, indeed, most people have probably heard of imposter syndrome, but actually it comes in, in five different ways. It doesn't, uh, it's not the same for, for all of us. So we're going to take a little brief look at that um, hopefully this week with the view to coming back next week and how we start this journey of overcoming the different types of imposter syndrome. Indeed, if, if you've been on the self-confidence program with me, part of, of this uh, conquering of imposter syndrome is through building core confidence, uh, core self-esteem. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about how do we do that. And then also in the latter week, Importantly for me, imposter syndrome is about understanding you, your qualities, your abilities, your values, your worth, and indeed your purpose. And imposter syndrome is evidently conquered when we have a deeper understanding of ourselves. Um, it's how I, in effect, talk, talk about how we destroy imposter syndrome. Um, so... That's what we're going to uh, hopefully do here over the next uh, number of weeks. I look really look forward to in, engaging with you um, and we'll, we'll bring you good content as we're going along. Now, one of the things I have said to Shannon, of course, is that we have a little online learning platform. Uh, we have the RH Week and in no way would that give me the opportunity to, to give you everything that you may want to know about imposter syndrome or indeed what might help you get over or indeed conquer imposter syndrome. So what we're going to do on that little platform is um, we are recording this each week. So again, if something happens by chance and you can't get along to one of the sessions, um, I don't want you to miss out. Um, I want you to keep informed so you can watch that little video back. Uh, indeed, I think business and community also put it on their YouTube channel. Um, but that will keep it in the little online learning forum for you. And what I'll do is then I'll add additional uh, videos and content and some self-help guides around each of the week's learning. So indeed, that will maybe help bring some of that to, to life for you. 
Indeed, and where different people have different learning styles and different learning methods, uh, this one, of course, is a little bit more traditional with um, some slides and, and me talking. But indeed, I, I'm aware of the fact that people will learn in many different ways. So um, we use that little online uh, platform to help reinforce or indeed help guide people who might want to learn in different ways. So what is this? We've talked about imposter syndrome being very heavily linked to self-confidence. Um, for many of you who were uh, on my last course, you'll have heard me say this before. Um, how do we conquer imposter syndrome? We realize that even when we're at the top of our game, even when we look at those people um, who seem to be the big players in the world, who uh, have big businesses or big decision makers, let me rest assure you, let me rest assure you today, even those at the very top, most of the time haven't got a clue what they're doing. They're just winging it, to use an old Northern Ireland term. Because imposter syndrome is about you feeling like you don't know what you're doing, or you're not able or capable to do what you need to do. But what I want to start with is to rest assure you, is even people at the top, and I think we see that a lot of times in our media, don't know what they're doing. They don't have a clue. They are just winging it. From those people who manage COVID, we've got wars, we've got banking crises, we've got financial problems, we've got people at the top of the legal arena making mistakes after mistakes after mistakes, and the list goes on. So what I want to share with you is many high achievers, and some of them I've been really fortunate to work with, over my short life, many high achievers share a dirty little secret. Deep down, they feel like complete frauds. Their accomplishments are the result of maybe serendipitous luck. Where did it come from? Where did this idea, though, of, of imposter syndrome come from? Um, the term, uh, folks, was first used by a psychologist called Susanna Eames and a lady called Pauline Rose Clance back in the 1970s. And, and this concept of imposter syndrome was introduced originally to uh, look at those high achieving women, okay? This is where it was first looked at, first studied, okay? Very much around high achieving women within America and within American business at that time. So, this, the concept of imposter syndrome is still quite young. Um, and since then, from the 1970s, we have built uh, a number of data fields and science and, and loads of books and studies. And I have a number of them here um, around me. I'm going to share one of the books that, that, that I first read when, when looking at this concept. Um, so it's become more of a, a wide e experience um, for a lot of people. So what are some of the symptoms, you ask? So Ed, I get what uh, imposter syndrome is, okay? Um, it's that, that feeling like you're a phony, like you're a fraud, like any time, at any time you're about to be found out. It is based in lack of self-confidence, but a lot of people will also uh, see imposter syndrome as, as a feeling of anxiety, a feeling of worry, um, a feeling of weariness um, as well. And it's all of those things. And when we look at the symptoms of what, uh, what imposter syndrome is, for, for some people, imposter syndrome can feel um, or can even fuel feelings of motivation to achieve. And this usually comes at a cost in the form of constant anxiety. Um, some people might over-prepare or work much harder than necessary to make sure that nobody finds out that they are a fraud. And, and this book sets up a vicious cycle in which you think that the only reason you have survived maybe that business presentation or that shareholders meeting or uh, that manager's meeting where you've had to bring people in, you, you believe that maybe the only reason that you were able to do that was because you, you spent or stayed up all night rehearsing. Or you think the only reason you got through um, maybe the family gathering at the weekend was, or maybe that big meeting was because you 
memorized all the details about all of the different people who were around the table. And, and the problem with imposter syndrome is that you experience, or, or that experience of doing well um, at something does nothing to change your belief. Okay, so even when you do well, even when you succeed, even when you have been able to be successful at something, the problem with imposter syndrome is it finds some way to convince you that it wasn't because you were capable or able. It has a way to play on your belief system, okay? Even if you are successful, even if you do something well, it has a way of preventing you from being able to see the success or the positivity even though um you might sail through a performance or maybe even have uh you know have good relationships with your co-workers um and you've done something well that thought of failure that you haven't done things right is still very prevalent in your head um and this makes sense i suppose for people in if we're thinking about um, social anxiety as well, okay? Um, social anxiety is very, very heavily linked to imposter syndrome as well. Um, so what are some of these symptoms? It says, I'm gonna bring some of them up here um, for you on the screen. Um, some of you might <clears throat> might think about these and go, yeah, Ed, I, I, I can see that. I can see that happening within me. Um, some of the symptoms is the inability to realistically assess your competence and your skills. So it might be you're really good at something. It might be you've actually did all the studying. You've did all of the hard work. But you still have convinced yourself that you are not able, that you are not competent enough, that you are not skilled enough in order to do the task or the job. Some of us may do really well. Okay, some of us might do really, really well at the things that we are, are trying to do in work, okay, or in family life. But we attribute those successes when we do well, we attribute those successes to something else. Maybe some of us just say it was a complete fluke, it was complete luck. Um, maybe it's because we had somebody good in our team. Okay, we find a way of actually convincing ourselves that it wasn't anything to do with ourselves. Um, some of us might uh, berate our performance, okay? Um, this is it's a negative doubt, the self-negative chatter. Some of you may have read that great uh, book um, called The Chimp Paradox, okay? Chimp Paradox is very much a book around talking about imposter syndrome, this negative self-chatter that berates your performance even when you've done so well and you've worked so hard to do something, your negative self-talk, this cheeky chimp, finds a way of convincing you that your performance was still very poor. Some of us have, again, this fear that you won't live up to expectations, okay? Nearly like you've oversold yourself. And now the worry is that to do that presentation, to achieve that sales figure, to develop that business or that product, to, to do good sales targets, whatever it may be in the world of business. We have that fear even before we start that we won't live up to expectations. Um, some of us sabotage our own success. And we're going to talk about where this fits into the model of the five different types of imposter syndrome. Um, again, this idea of self-doubt is part of imposter syndrome. Okay, this is where the, the lack of self-confidence sometimes comes in, or certainly self-doubt plays upon our confidence. And indeed, this is, this is another part of <clears throat> imposter syndrome, is for some of us, we will set very challenging goals and ultimately feel disappointed when we don't achieve them. Actually, for a lot of people, imposter syndrome is about setting goals and targets that you know you're never going to achieve so you know that you're defeated even before you start that process um when we talk then about identifying imposter syndrome so that's a number of the symptoms 
Okay, that's the number of the outworking symptoms. A lot of this is what we hear in our head. Okay, this is a lot of what I call the, some of you might know what the yin and the yang of life, the, the black and the white. Um, but I like to sort of go with that concept of, of the chimp paradox, i.e. this negative inner voice deep within inside you that even when you do things well, even when you know you should succeed, um, I often remember imposter syndrome actually for me was the first time I become a parent and was uh, trying to bathe my little born son in, in the bath. And I felt that, how can, how can I do this? Um, I'm not capable of bathing my child. I'm going to do some damage to my child. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt my child. My, my child's going to, in some way, uh, be significantly worse off because I am going to be trying to bathe my child, this self-doubt. And even when I did it, and my child had a lovely bath at the age of uh, a number of weeks old, and the little plastic bath that we get, I still had that operation in my head that, that I didn't do this. This was just by some way fluke that the child hadn't managed to get hurt. That um, my performance as a father and doing that process was uh, just pure fluke. Okay. Had big, big self-doubt issues. Now, that's one area where we, we see it. There's many, many other areas. So think about some of those outworking negative thoughts, some of those processes that we we take ourselves down some of those rabbit holes and i'm sure some of you today will go ed listen a lot of those things that's how i think that has become my culture that has become my mindset when doing my work doing my job doing my career and um, some of us may be involved in community some of us i'm sure will be parents at home so imposter syndrome comes into all of those areas and whilst imposter syndrome is not recognized as a disorder in the manual of, I suppose, mental disorders or indeed mental health, it is not uncommon. It is estimated that about 70% of people will experience at least, at least one episode of imposter syndrome in their lives. And if you think you might have imposter syndrome, I would get you to reflect on some of the questions that I'm about to uh, discuss with you, okay? Um, the first thing for me was, do you agonize over even the smallest mistakes or flaws in your work? That's one thing, one question that you might ask yourself in identifying, do you have imposter syndrome? Maybe you attribute your success to luck or some outside factors. Okay, we've already mentioned that one. Are you very sensitive to constructive criticism? Do you feel like you will be inevitably be found out to be a phony? Maybe that's also one way to question do you or do you suffer from imposter syndrome and do you maybe downplay your own expertise your own ability your own self-worth in the areas where you're genuinely more skilled than others and if you often find yourself feeling like a fraud or an imposter for me, it may, be, it may be helpful to talk to somebody. The negative thinking, the self-doubt, the self-sabotage that often characterizes imposter syndrome can then go on to affect your life in many, many ways. Um, importantly for me, imposter syndrome can appear in a number of different ways. Okay, there's some of the questions that we can ask ourselves, some of the ways in which we can help identify imposter syndrome is through our own reflection, 
through some of those questions that we have just discussed. But importantly, we have these five types of imposter, or what we call the five types of imposter syndrome. Okay, so if you're sitting there today listening and engaging with this concept for the first time, for me, we self-reflect on some of this information that we are, are, are now looking at. Maybe for the first time, we've, we've heard some of the questions. So indeed, some of the self-regulated questions that we can ask ourselves in terms of, are we in a position where we may have allowed a little bit of imposter syndrome to uh, creep in to our mindset? Maybe for some of us today, we answered yes to all five of those areas, all five of those questions. Maybe imposter syndrome has become a way of life for you. Maybe this mindset of imposter syndrome has taken over um, a lot of what you do, a lot of where you go, a lot of things that you say. Um, and why is that? Indeed, this is why I go back to where I started, is that Imposter syndrome doesn't just reside in people who um, are, are, are not achieving in life. Imposter syndrome does not just lie in those who may look like they have everything that they need in life. They're maybe very successful. Indeed, imposter syndrome is more likely to reside in those people who are very successful. And here's why. This is when we consider who and what types of imposter syndrome exist, then we can start to see actually imposter syndrome may be something that affects people who look successful, look like they're doing really well, look like they have everything in hand. And why is this? The first one I want to look at with you this morning is the perfectionist. The perfectionist. The perfectionist is the first type of imposter syndrome and perfectionists are never satisfied they always feel that their work could be better and rather than focusing on their strengths they tend to fixate on any flaws or mistakes and this often leads to a great deal of self-pressure and indeed high amounts of anxiety and perfectionist imposter syndrome often go hand in hand. Perfectionism, imposter syndrome. Think about it. Perfectionists set excessively high goals for themselves. And when they fail to reach a goal, they then experience major self-doubt and worry, maybe about measuring up, about how they look in the boardroom, how they look in front of their peers, their colleagues. And whether they realize it or not, this group can also be a uh, controllist or people who could try to control everything and feeling like they want something done right they have to do it themselves okay think about that not sure if this applies to you or indeed today and reflect it maybe people in your team could be people in your workplace um some of the things i often reflect on have you ever been accused of being a micromanager do you have difficulty delegating even when you're able to do so? Do you feel frustrated and disappointed in results even when you miss those highly insane targets? Uh, do you accuse yourself of not being good enough for the job? And do you ruminate for days when something goes wrong? Do you feel like your work maybe must be 100% perfect? 100% of the time. And if you answer yes to some of those questions, that may be some of the outworkings of the perfectionist imposter syndrome. And for this type, success is rarely satisfying because perfectionists who have imposter, the perfectionist imposter syndrome always believe they could have done better. But folks, we know that's neither productive nor healthy. Um, owning and celebrating achievements for me is essential if you want to avoid burnout, find contentment in life, and indeed cultivate this self-confidence. 
We'll talk a little bit next week then about how does the perfectionist uh, conquer imposter syndrome. Okay, so that's the first area. Okay. Second one then is the superhero. Okay. Now, because these individuals feel inadequate, they feel compelled to push themselves to work as hard as possible. Since people who experience this superhero imposter syndrome, they have themselves convinced that they're phonies amongst their colleagues. And they often, often push to work harder, uh, to measure up. They, they often work really long hours. They're often the ones always doing overtime. They're often always the ones pushing themselves forward to do more and more work. But this is just a false cover for their insecurities. Um, and the workload may harm, as we know, not only their mental health, but their relationships with others. People have this, who have this superhero imposter syndrome work hard in the hope that people never call them out. Okay, the work, always putting yourself forward, always doing something, is that insecurity of covering up that other people may find you out to be a phony. Now, if you're always doing work, always working hard, always doing the overtime, always being the one to push yourself forward, there's less likelihood that somebody will call you out to be a phony. Does this apply to you? Again, some of the questions that we might ask ourselves is, do you stay later at the office than the rest of your team? Even maybe past the point that you've completed the day's work that was necessary. Maybe do you get stressed when you're not working? Think about that. That's the big one. Do you get stressed when you're not working? And even find downtime completely wasteful. Have you maybe left your hobbies and your passions? Have you let them fall by the wayside and sacrificed them to just to do work? Uh, maybe do you feel like you haven't truly earned your title? And work and um, that you feel so pressured to work harder and longer than those around you in order to prove your worth see imposter workaholics or imposter superheroes are actually addicted to this thing called validation that comes from working not to the work itself okay the superhero becomes addicted to validation and it's that validation that means that they'll not get found out to be a phony. Okay, and that comes from working, just doing things, not from the work itself. We'll look at how the superhero then helps themselves overcome imposter syndrome next week. Then we have the expert, okay? Um, we've all got an expert in the workplace. That's not to say that they're suffering from uh, imposter syndrome, of course. But again, this is one of the five um, examples of where imposter syndrome really, really flourishes. And these individuals are always trying to learn more and more and are never satisfied with their level of understanding. Even though these people are often highly skilled, they underestimate their own experience. I'm working with somebody at the moment who is a, a senior director in Apple here in Ireland, has more degrees coming out of their name than, again, what I would call that I can shake a stick at. Um, but no matter how many degrees, no matter how much education they do, no matter how many qualifications they have in their hand to say, you are fantastic and you have a skill set and you have an ability, to do what it is that you're doing, they still can't see that they have that ability. So they keep learning and learning more as a way to, in some way, convince the brain that they can do the job that they're asked to do. They often and will underestimate their own expertise. And as we know, experts measure their competence based on what and how much they know and can do. So believing they will never know enough, they fear being exposed as inexperienced or 
under knowledgeable? Do you suffer from the expert imposter syndrome? Do you shy away from applying to jobs? Maybe uh, opportunities to progress, um, maybe opportunities to take a, a, a new job in a different organization with better opportunities. Um, are you constantly seeking out training or certifications because you think you need to improve your skills in order to succeed? Now, put a health warning on that, of course, it's not wrong to seek out new training and certification. Part of this program is to give you some training and education around this concept of imposter syndrome. That is not a problem. It's when it becomes excessive or it becomes an issue when you don't see that you have in any way enhanced your skills that you haven't been able to consciously become aware of the fact that your skills have improved as part of doing a training program then people then reach out and they keep doing the same thing again and again and again in order to convince themselves so that just i say i'm not saying that training and certification is a problem of course it's not but when it becomes excessive or it becomes linked to exactly the same skill set that you have and you keep doing it again and again and again, then that may be one of those things that say you're suffering from the expert imposter syndrome. And even if you've been in a role for some time, um, you, can, you can relate to the feelings like you're still not enough to do the job. Okay, some people have been in jobs and are absolutely fantastic at doing them, but they still have themselves convinced that they don't know enough, that they're not capable enough. Okay, so that's the third one. And we'll look again next week at how the expert helps themselves uh, conquer their form of imposter syndrome. Uh, number four, then, we have this person called the natural genius. And these folks set individuals, individual goals, or they set excessively lofty goals for themselves and then often feel crushed when they don't succeed on their first try. Um, one of the uh, academics around imposter syndrome, a guy called Michael Young, says people with this type of natural genius, uh, imposter syndrome, believe they need to be the natural genius. And as such, they judge their competence. They judge their own competence. Uh, based on ease and speed as opposed to their own efforts. In other words, they, if they take a long time to master something, they feel shame. And these types of imposters set their internal bar probably impossibly high, just like perfectionists. But natural genius types don't just judge themselves based on ridiculous expectations. They also judge themselves based on getting things right on the first try. And when they're not able to do something quickly or fluently, their alarm bell sounds. Again, not sure if this applies to you. Some of the things that I would get people to reflect on. Are you used to maybe excelling without much effort? Do you have maybe a track record of getting straight A's or gold stars in everything you do? Were you told frequently as a child that maybe you were the smart one in your family or your peer group? Maybe you dislike the idea of having a mentor or somebody to work with you because you can handle things on your own. And maybe also when you're faced with setback, does your confidence tumble because not provoke or not performing provokes a feeling of shame? Maybe you often avoid challenges because it's so uncomfortable to try something that you're not great at. So again, we'll talk next week just about how that person um, overcomes imposter syndrome. Then we have the last one, and this one is probably one where a lot of us will resonate with, okay? This might be one for me as probably the most common type of imposter syndrome, and this is a soloist. And these people tend to be very individualistic and prefer, prefer and prefer to work alone. Self-worth often stems from their productivity. 
So they often reject offers of assistance, of help. And they tend to see asking for help as a sign of weakness or indeed incompetent. Sufferers who feel as though they're asking for help might reveal their phoniness. Okay, this is the one where people worry about getting caught out as being a phony, that they're not able to do the job, that they're not capable of doing the job. And thus they like to work on their own. They don't like other people to be around them because people might catch them out. People might see that they're not able to do the job. And it's okay to be independent, but not to the extent that you refuse assistance so that you can prove your worth. Not sure if this one applies to you. Um, some of the questions that I would ask is, do you firmly feel that you need to accomplish things on your own? Um, maybe you always say, I don't need anyone's help. Does that sound like you? Um, do you maybe frame requests in terms of the requirements of a project rather than your needs as a person? Maybe you're always the person turning down help, even though you need help, even though you need support. Indeed, this was the one that probably reflected me more whenever I was going through my own journey of imposter syndrome and that I knew I needed help. I knew I needed people around me, but I took on the workload. So again, there's a little bit of the superhero mixed with the soloist. So I took on all of the work and the hope that nobody would notice that I was a phony. And then I would always work on my own because it would mean then nobody would ever find out that I wasn't able to do the work that I was taking on as a superhero. So that's the five key areas of imposter syndrome, okay? There are the five um, sort of key, uh, you know, it's they're, they're the key uh, methods that we look at. So in terms of how do we help people move forward with imposter syndrome, usually what we try to do is then to get people to identify with one or a number of the different models um, within imposter syndrome. Maybe today you're thinking, you know what, I'm a little bit of all five of those, Ed. Um, and that's fine. That, that's perfectly normal for people who have had imposter syndrome for probably quite long periods of their life. A little bit like anxiety. Anxiety starts usually as panic attacks within people. And then it evolves over time if it's not recognized and and the symptoms of anxiety are not treated or you don't maybe go and look after your mental well-being, then anxiety will evolve. It'll move from panic attacks to maybe generalized anxiety, to social anxiety, to health anxiety, then on to OCD. And for some people, the most aggressive form of anxiety, which is PTSD. So because imposter syndrome is very heavily linked to, society, uh, to anxiety and indeed self confidence and self-esteem then some of us may evolve into the different uh, methods or indeed the different labels that we've looked at this morning so we may over time evolve ourselves with a little bit of all of the five different types of imposter syndrome but for some of us we may be fairly dominant in one of the areas of imposter syndrome as well so each one of those will have a will have a way to help you move forward. So again, we'll, we will look at that next week, but what I want you to do this week is just to realize that it, it is a general term, a little bit like anxiety, but within anxiety, the same as imposter syndrome, we have different ways of identifying the type of imposter syndrome that somebody may be suffering from. How do we move forward? I just want to look at this briefly with you today and this is where we'll we'll, we'll bring the, the, the latter part of the session together i think it just teases up nicely it teases us a little bit of what well then ed how do if i if i do have this um how can i start to um how can i start to progress how can i start to improve um and i love this book folks um it was the first book that i read around imposter syndrome it's called the secret thoughts of a successful woman Okay, and I said it was designed to help women 
um, who suffered from imposter syndrome to be able to thrive in spite of it. Okay, great book. I will try and see if I can get some of the information. I can get some snippets and PDF. I'm happy enough to send you the link out. But those people who are really serious um, about wanting to move forward from an, an imposter syndrome, to conquer imposter syndrome, um, I would definitely spend a few pounds on Amazon to get this book yourself. It's very relatable and indeed very, very easy to follow. But no matter the specific profile, um, when we looked at five, if you struggle with confidence, um, you're far from alone. To take one example, studies suggest that 70% of people will experience imposter syndrome at some part of their career. And to get past this imposter syndrome, not only do you need to identify maybe one of the five types, but you need to start asking yourself some hard questions. What core beliefs do I hold about myself? Do I believe I am worthy of, of love or success or opportunity as I am? And must I be perfect to others for them to approve of me? That's just some questions that I identified on my own journey. And there's many different questions you can ask yourself. Um, but that's just three that you might reflect on. And to move past these feelings, you need to become comfortable confronting some of those deeply ingrained beliefs that have gripped you about yourself. You have put those beliefs in there as part of your journey of learning from you were a child. And this exercise can be hard because you might not even realize that you hold some of these beliefs about yourself. But here are some of the techniques that you can use. Okay, some of the techniques that you can use, and these will tear us up nicely for coming in um, next week. Some of the things that I find work really well is to share your feelings. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, men on here today. I know this can be very difficult for men. Indeed, that was my biggest difficulty early on was because I was seen as successful and because I was in a career where I was seen to be doing well, I found it very difficult to share feelings which reflected a more negative or a, a, an unsuccessful view of, of me. But that's the first step of moving past imposter syndrome. Not only asking yourself those questions about confronting the, the comfortableness that you have got yourself into, you've got to start learning to share your feelings. You've got to talk to other people about how you're feeling. Those irrational beliefs, that negative chatter that tends to fester, it's hidden away. Indeed, it's not something that is talked about. Focus on others. Um, why this might feel maybe counterproductive for, for, for some people, um, trying to help others in the same situation as you, situation as you is actually one of the ways of, of helping you move past imposter syndrome. If you see someone who seems awkward or alone, Maybe ask that person a question to bring them into a group. And as you practice your own, as you practice your skills, you will then build confidence and understanding um, within yourself. One of the other areas we're going to look at is assessing your abilities. If you have maybe long held beliefs about your incompetence in social and performance situations, Maybe make a realistic assessment of your abilities. Write down your accomplishments. Start journaling. Okay, journaling is, is fantastic. Writing about you, reflecting on you. Write down your own accomplishments and what you're good at. Tell the conscious brain. Say it for yourself. Okay, and compare that with your own self-assessment. Take some baby steps. Listen. Don't focus on doing things perfectly, but rather focus on doing things reasonably well. And for me, reward yourself for taking action. Um, for example, and maybe in a group conversation, you offer an opinion or share a story. 
um, about yourself. Um, question your thoughts. As you start to assess your abilities and take baby steps, question whether your thoughts are rational. Does it make sense to believe that you're a fraud, given everything that you know about yourself and given everything that you've achieved to date? Stop comparing. See, every time you compare yourself to others in a social situation, you will find some fault in yourself that fuels the feeling of not being good enough or not belonging or not being adequate, and it drives imposter syndrome. Instead, maybe during conversations, focus on listening to what others or other people are saying, but be genuinely interested in learning more about people rather than comparing yourself to other people. Maybe use social media you know, moderately. When we know that we overuse social media, um, and social media drives those feelings of inferiority, maybe if you try to portray an image on social media that doesn't match who you really are, or show things that are impossible to achieve, or do you say people you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and you always fall short just to make yourself look much bigger than you are. This will only make your feelings of being a fraud and drive imposter syndrome. Stop fighting your feelings. Don't, um, don't fight the feelings of not belonging. Instead, try to learn or try to lean into them and accept them. It's only when you acknowledge your feelings that you can start to unravel those core beliefs that you're holding back. And refuse to let imposter syndrome hold you back. A little bit like anxiety. When you're anxious about something, go towards it. Don't stand back from it. No matter how much you feel like you don't belong, don't let that stop you from pursuing your goals. Keep going and refuse to be stopped. I'm going to finish just on this little slide. And I want to, again, just share something that, 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 that worked for me. And this... This is a personal piece, folks. This, for me, worked for me. It may not work for you. It might be something else. And we're going to look at all of these different methods over the next number of weeks. But what worked for me was telling a friend, okay? Um, disclosing your feelings to a trusted friend or even for young people, a favorite teacher or a close colleague, hopefully will come you'll come away from that experience with what I call boosted spirits. Um, if your friend simply tells you to stop feeling insecure or there's nothing wrong with you, then you need to think about going and talking to somebody else, okay? Because if you could just stop it, you would have already stopped it. You'd have stopped, you would have stopped that pain and experience that you feel from imposter syndrome. But importantly for me, telling a friend, somebody who could see the phoniness in you, somebody who could see the way in which you were covering up. Again, I go back to that picture of the mask. I always say the person who doesn't take your bullshit, <laughs> somebody who you get quite cross with whenever they're honest with you, that's the type of person who you want to be able to speak to when it comes to moving past imposter syndrome. Somebody who will tell you what you may not want to know, but what you need to know. One of the other big things for me, which is really important, is to teach. Um, to teach. You'll be surprised how much you know already. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about teaching this subject. I'm talking about getting out into the world, community, working with young people, working with older people, um, working with people who may not know some little bits of information that you know. And as we become more confident in our field, um, we, we start to consciously realize how much we know about ourselves, about how much we know about the world, but indeed how much we have yet to learn, which um, for me helps us get gain a perspective on who we are. It reminds ourselves of just how far you've come. Um, being able to help nurture and support that next generation with even little bits of information helps build your self-confidence, helps build also your resilience as well. But importantly, it pushes back an imposter syndrome because you start to realize, again, for those people who are maybe the, um, the superheroes or importantly those um, who 
are, can't convince themselves that they do know more than what they know. And um, one of the ways to do that is to go out and actually teach all of that information and that knowledge that you have learned. Um, remember, it's okay not to know what you're doing. Okay. After any big life event, after changing school, moving a promotion, moving jobs, starting a new world with family and everything else, there's no book. There's no book that tells you how to do this. This is a steep learning curve. And rather than hiding, think of yourself, what I used to call as a public amateur or a boss in training. <laughs> you don't want to maybe put the big sign on your back, but someone who is learning and gaining experience and gaining experience in, in the public eye. And as long as you're enthusiastic about learning, people will always give you some slack, okay? And the last one for me is, just in finishing is, keep a little imposter syndrome in, in your pocket, okay? Um, a balance exists between imposter syndrome and uh, you know, slick, grinning, ignominia, authentic modesty keeps you real, okay? So there, there we have it, okay? Some things to help fight the effects of imposter syndrome, which we will start to, to build on over the next number of weeks. Um, we'll also look at the, we'll go into the five different areas again next week and just pull out some of the specifics that might help people uh, conquer imposter syndrome there. And importantly from this, always remember you're not alone, okay? Um, great words of a lady called Tina Fey, uh, she uh, had imposter syndrome and what was really important was she had this quote of everyone else is an imposter too okay so keep a little imposter syndrome in your pocket um, I have a little quote I always says I'm not against self-esteem but I believe self-esteem is just a meter that reads out the state of the system it's not an end in itself. When you're doing well in school or work, when you're doing well with the people you love, when you're doing well in the play, the meter will register high. When you're doing badly, it will register low. That's part of life. But unfortunately, when the, when the meter starts to register low, that's when imposter syndrome really starts to kick in. Folks, that's... Um, all I have to bring to you today. Um, the next, as I said, the next three weeks, we're going to dive into these five areas of imposter syndrome a little bit more. Um, but then we're going to start focusing on our self-confidence, our self-worth, our values. We're really going to challenge ourselves because if we're going to conquer imposter syndrome, let's be honest, it took a lot of work to put it there. It didn't just arrive overnight. It didn't just sneak in through the back door and there it is to surprise us all. It started because of a state of mind which we allowed to fester and progress and become deeply ingrained in ourselves. So it does take a little bit of work to try and push that intruder um, back out the door. But one of the things I hope to be able to do with you over the next three weeks is to give you that confidence in yourself and your own abilities, your own capabilities and your own special gifts to push beyond that imposter push it out the door, except that it may already be there, but it's just looking in through the back door. It never gets back in through and into end of the house again, and you can smile gracefully out the window at it. So listen, thank you for today, folks. And, and Shannon, happy to take any questions. Uh, 